All right, everyone joining us or joining us virtually. Um, my name is Jesse Whelan. I'm the Associate Director at the Office of National Fellowships. We also have uh, Dr. Filer with us today. Would you like to briefly introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. I'm Craig Filer. I am the Director of the Office. Uh, and so today we're going to be talking uh, about public service fellowships specifically. Um, our office works with students of all different majors, applying to all different types of opportunities. Um, and, and <clears throat> I don't know if uh, some of you joining virtually are in the same camp, whether you're a first year student, third year, fourth year student, we have opportunities for you anywhere in between. Um, we're going to be talking uh, or leading off with specifically with Dr. Filer talking about the Truman Scholarship, which may be one of the major awards that a lot of you in attendance today are wanting to hear more about. Um, so we'll start with that one and then I'm going to supplement after that with other uh, formative fellowships that might uh, influence, uh, you know, positively influence your Truman application um, or help you find other internships and experiences in your field. Um, I also made the uh, wise decision of accidentally saving this uh, or sending myself the PDF version. Um, so we can scroll through it, uh, but unfortunately it's not a PowerPoint. Um, so I do apologize, but the information is all the same. Um, and so... Dr. Filer is going to kick us off in talking about the Truman Scholarship, and we'll go in there. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, everybody. So the Truman Scholarship is an award that's been around for about 40 years now. It is meant to identify and support students who want to enter public service. When it was originally founded, and sometimes this is a misconception about Truman, it was originally intended for students who wanted to go into politics. Absolutely. But... In the 40 years since the award has been around, it is now so much more inclusive in terms of how they think about public service and how they want to meet you where you are and how you encounter public service. And so what the award does, as you can see here, it provides you around $30,000 in support towards your graduate study. Uh, that can be towards law school, that can be towards med school, it can be towards any sort of graduate education, certainly traditional masters or degrees or PhDs. And you can see here what they're looking for is committed to premier careers in government, nonprofit education, or elsewhere in public service. And so the way they often describe it, if eventually you want to work for a .gov, a .edu, or a .org, this is the type of plan for you. If you're wanting to work for a .com, that's private enterprise usually. And so really we're looking for people that want to go into the public sector in one of those three areas. It's not a complete catch-all, but it's a good way to sort of break it down, .gov, .org, .edu. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. we'll, we'll take turns scrolling. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so the eligibility for this award, and for some of you, this will be coming down in a year or two, and that is okay. But the window is opening for those of you that are finishing up your second year here at the university. They are looking for juniors in the traditional sense to apply for the award. So we've just wrapped up this year's uh, competition. Uh, we had a finalist this year, and we are, we'll find out probably in the next couple of weeks whether or not they receive the award. But this is a process we started basically as we started to head into summer for those of you that will be in your third years. So when you see that they want you to be junior level academic standing, they are not talking about the number of credit hours. Most of you are bringing in more credit hours than ever before. And so you may have even started in your first year as a junior. And you may say to yourself, Dr. Filer, like, well, I could go ahead and do this. I'm going to tell you absolutely not. Think of it like this. If the traditional plan is for students to apply for Truman in their third year, and you come at it in your first or your second year, you are going to be disadvantaged because of the time. It is expected that you come in in your third year so that you have at least two plus a little bit of years on campus in the community doing work to make a strong case for yourself as a Truman Scholar. Yes, we'll talk a little bit more about what you intend to do in your career in public service, but they also need to see the baseline of what you have been doing while you're here at school. And so when they say junior level, they mean third year, um, and, and we will hold you to that. Now, you may also say, well, I'm going to graduate early. I'm going to graduate in three years. That is okay. You still apply in your third year, right? And so you're like, oh, so if I'm a three-year student, then I apply in my second year. Nope, nope, nope. Still apply in your third year. So really, you want to have at least two full years at the university 
to do the things that you're doing so that you can make a strong case for yourself as to why you would be a strong candidate. You also see here that you need to be a U.S. citizen or a, a national. That is um, okay if you're in the process of receiving citizenship. That usually works out fine. Um, the residency is, is um, specific, but we also have ways to work with it. And so if you are an international student, this award will not be appropriate for you, but we do have other awards that we work with that are eligible for students who may not have residency or U.S. citizenship. The deadline is always going to be in early November for campus, and I'm pretty sure we have a slide here to talk about the process in a little more detail, but please keep in mind that if this is interesting to you, there's nothing you need to do today. We will actually send follow-up information from this presentation to everyone who's registered so you can come in and talk to us. We really would start working on the application process sometime towards the end of summer. And the application is usually going to be due for us on campus the first Wednesday of November. We haven't set that specifically, but that has been pretty much traditionally where that deadline has fallen. So sometime between November 1 and November 7 every fall. So if you look at your calendar, I'm not sure where that is, but that is probably going to be the deadline for this coming fall as well. I don't think we have a slide for the application process yeah. specifically, but could you speak a little bit more to yeah. that? Yeah, I'll speak to it a little bit more. So, so the application itself is one of the more lengthy applications that we work with. And that's not to overwhelm or to scare you, but it's really just to instill in you that's why it takes a little bit of time. All the pro programs and the processes that we work with with applications, we really want to be working with you probably at a minimum of two months over several weeks. We want to workshop these. You all may consider yourself a strong writer and you very well may be, but the type of writing that's required for the applications that we work with is usually not something that most of you are familiar with. It's usually short form writing, things that are a paragraph to a page long, and we are really practiced and know how to teach you how to condense your writing so that it is very dense, but also very personable and very readable. And that's what we workshop these application materials with you on. With the Truman application, there's basically mm, like three different things that you're going for. There's going to be several questions that are resume based, right? They're asking you to list out the things that you do. And so they're going to ask you, what have you been doing as a college student? What are you doing on campus? They're also going to ask, what have you been doing in the community? What have you been doing off campus in terms of your service hours, your service work? And then they also ask if you've done any governmental work. There's not an expectation that you've done it, but they do have a place for you to list it on there. And so if you think about campus, community, and governmental work, the way they think about it is you should be doing work in two of those three areas at least. So if you're not doing any governmental work, that's okay, but you should be doing work on campus and doing work in the community. Similarly, if you may not have a lot of campus involvement, but if you're doing community involvement, you're doing governmental work, that's usually going to be okay as well. It certainly, and if you're doing all three, that is good. This is also why it's good to be here early, because if you're here in your first year, you may have already gotten involved really on campus, and that still gives you time to get involved either in the community or doing some sort of governmental work, right? <laughs> all right, so the second type of question, they're short answer questions, and these are usually of two types. Uh, the first are, what have you been doing? And so they ask you to describe in great detail a very specific leadership example, a very specific service example, and then also they want you to talk about a problem in society you want to address in public service. And again, this is where they leave it for you to describe what is the issue that's important to you and to do it in great detail. So that leadership and that service activity, those are sort of the key components in terms of your experience. And we talk a lot about, well, what is leadership and what is service? How do you engage in it? How do you describe it? And that's one of the things that we workshop because oftentimes students will have the misconception that the only way to talk about leadership is through position. And that, of course, that's a logical place to start. This idea, I was the vice president of this organization and I was responsible for that. But leadership happens in so many more different ways. Sometimes the most interesting leadership experiences aren't about a position you held, but rather an initiative that you took or an opportunity to address a problem that may or may not have a leadership position associated with it. Sort of the second type of writing is about what you want to do in the future. And as I mentioned before, they're going to ask you about this. They're going to ask you what type of graduate program are you thinking about? And as a first year student, you might be like, 
that seems like five years from now, but it's a really useful exercise because you'll be looking at very specific schools maybe a year or two before your peers are doing that. And while you're not locked into anything, they want to hear how you're thinking about the graduate or the law school or the med school program that you might want to go to. They'll also ask you about how you envision the first couple of steps of your career to look. And so what is that job you would want to have right out of your graduate program? What is that job you would want to have right after that? And so you really have to do some very specific sort of visioning of what your life could look like. It is uh, a useful exercise and it's not a contractual one. And so it helps you ground your path into something very specific, but with the understanding that nobody's gonna hold you to it in a contractual way. Even if you win the award, they're not going to come in and say, oh, wait a minute, you said in here, you're gonna have this position with Department of Justice, but you took a, a position over here, give us our money back. They're not gonna do that. Uh, they're gonna trust you to basically follow the path uh, as long as you're working for a .gov, a .edu, or a .org, they're going to be happy. And then there's also a policy piece, and this is really your chance to show them how you think about solving a problem. You don't have to be a policy wonk. You don't have to be in political science to really do these successfully. It's really about, okay, here's this thing I'm passionate about. I really wish we could change X. And so it's like, Here's X, you explain what X is, and then you give a solution for how to solve X, breaking down a policy into mathematical terms. It's not very long, it's only about a page long, and so you're not having to write pages and pages and pages, but rather they want a snapshot of how you would engage with real world issues in the public sphere to try and solve them. The, um, you take all these together, you get some letters of recommendation, you get a uh, transcript, you put that all in, we do some interviews, we have some nominees, and basically what we're hoping that you get out of this application as well, the other one that, that Jesse's going to talk about in a second, is a better ability to articulate your thoughts around yourself, as well as the things that you're passionate about. So regardless of the outcome of the application, you are learning to become your own best advocate so that you can take that skill to further applications. You can take it to your own grad school, law school, or med school applications, to job applications, and those sorts of things. So we really want you to learn how to become your own best advocate and how to see the potential for the things that you can do. It's probably much bigger than the things that you may be giving yourself the space to inhabit. I'll just mention also right here, uh, this is a Brill Hunter. She is at a law school, no, grad school, there we go, uh, in Georgetown right now. She's studying environmental policy. Uh, she was our Truman Scholar from two years ago, and she is doing amazing work. Her whole sort of dossier was built around her interest in environmental justice. She's an environmental science major, environmental studies major, I'm sorry, and she basically looked at environmental justice through several different lenses, and that's what she talked about in her application. It's what she's continuing to do in her graduate study. So, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think um, maybe you mentioned it, but I, I think Truman is very specific in not defining public service on the right. website. Yeah, and so the way, the way I describe that, and, and this is just another way to think about it, so thank you for mentioning that, they don't define public service explicitly. They really want to hear how you talk about it. And so again, as long as it is your understanding of how to serve the public and you make a very strong case for it, they honestly don't care what your field is. We've had students from almost any field you can imagine that have come to this award. We've had people in the arts, in business, we've had people in communications, of course, the social sciences, the, the human sciences, uh, certainly in STEM, we've had them in the humanities. And so it's really about how are you thinking about how you want to give back, how you want to basically make the world a better place for the folks in it. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, I'm gonna turn this over to Jesse. Awesome. I will do this Thank you, Craig. Yeah, and I think that's a uh, that's a good segue into the next award, which I think is is it boring okay. or is it no humanity next? Oh, it's not, but it, that's okay. We'll get to it eventually, anyways. Um, and so now the, the rest of the fellowships that we're going to be talking about um, are are fantastic experiences in their own right. Just going to be a, a little bit different uh, than um, uh, the Truman Scholarship. Um, but can allow you those experiences to engage perhaps with those communities that you might be wanting to positively impact uh, later in your career, uh, hopefully through a career in public service. But humanity in action is also very broad in its scope. Uh, it's not looking for students from any particular major, so very similar to Truman in that way. Um, but humanity in action looks at the study 
of human rights and social justice initiatives from both a historical and a contemporary perspective. Um, and so they have different, and as you can see, they have one site in the United States, in Atlanta, and then the rest of these sites are gonna be abroad uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and so students from all of these countries are going to, I know these are cities listed, but uh, so Poland, Germany, uh, Denmark, you know, you get the picture, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, I believe as well, um, are all eligible to apply. And so students from all of these countries are going to be part of the cohort uh, that you are a part of. Um, and so when you're looking at these different programs online through HIA, what you will see is that all of these different placements have very similar themes uh, in, in terms of, of, of what you are studying, um, but they are all uniquely tailored to the country, to the city that you are in, that is going to dictate uh, the guest speaker, uh, speakers and lecturers that come and uh, in, in participate in your program. It's going to dictate the site visits uh, and museums and the places that you go and engage with. Um, and so you can if you're genuinely interested in the curriculum from all of these different places, you can select all of them, or you can select the institutes that you are most uniquely interested in and why. Um, and so this is a summer program, um, and it is funded during the program itself. Um, but you'll notice on the website, and just this is just kind of an aside, there is an application fee and they don't cover airfare. However, they do understand that students come uh, to this opportunity with financial need. And so if you do need to advocate for yourself, let us know. They can waive both the application fee and they can help you cover airfare. Um, but, but yeah, we have sent students, I think, uh, over the years, nearly to every program. Kiara Gilbert um, was actually um, one of three that we sent in 2019. Um, we sent those students to uh, Copenhagen, Berlin, and Atlanta, I believe. Unfortunately, it did shut down for a couple of years during the pandemic, but now this program is back up and running again. Um, and so when you're going through this application, um, they do, um, uh, it was, it, in previous years, this application used to change with the times. And so it was very, like, not hard to prepare for, but it was one where um, you had to uh, read very specific articles or watch videos that they provided, um, you know, or interviews that they provided. You'd have to watch and prepare all of these materials in order to respond to the prompts. Um, that as of last, this most recent cycle, um, at least that was the first that I had seen where the application, uh, they had, had altered the essays to be more consistent from year to year, um, but they are still asking you to write about current events and things that you care about and how you're engaging um, in those issues, both through your academic study, through your community engagement, through governmental work, so all of the things that Craig was talking about uh, with Truman. Um, and so this is an application you can really make your own. And then on the back end of this, uh, you do have, uh, and so this is open, I should have said, uh, this is for second year students, sophomores traditionally, all the way up until two years out of graduation. So you have usually about that five year window uh, in which you can apply. And then after that summer experience, you have the following year in order to implement what is called an action project that is completely up to you and of your own design. Um, but it is essentially showing how you are going to apply what you have studied and, uh, and what you have gained from this opportunity uh, on campus, in your community, in your work. Um, and so that's something that they ask that you outline in the application. Um, but like Craig was saying, it's like if, if it changes, you know, if your idea is like they care less about that, they care more that it's still going to be a, a, an impactful, feasible idea for the year that you have. Um, you scroll on from HIA, uh, eligibility, um, yeah, like I said, uh, students and recent graduates, so you have about that two-year window after you graduate, all majors. What is, I think, one of the more challenging things about humanity in action uh, really lies in when it's due, um, and so early January means we are coming off of winter break, and so... Um, if you want to be like me, I would like to not work over uh, the winter holiday. And so this is one that uh, we do need to kind of at least start talking about it sooner rather than later. And so we can start talking about it in August and September, you know, before the, uh, but I mean, we need to wait until the application opens. And I believe it usually opens around early October, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, but regardless, there's work that we can do ahead of time. So then you can transition into focusing on 
on your finals uh, uh, in early December. Um, and then we can finalize some work in like that one or two weeks that we have like right when we get back. Um, so it is a little bit tricky in terms of deadline, but with proper planning, that should not really be an issue. And now moving on from humanity and action, this is the one that uh, I think is, is, a, is a really great segue from talking about Truman in the, in the sense that Truman doesn't define public service on the website. The Boring Scholarship, which really does emphasize national security, also doesn't define national security on its website. That is up for the student to define. And so what Boring supports is students that are interested in foreign language study, ideally on their way to a career in working for the federal government. Uh, they, there is a lot of uh, diversity in terms of like those positions that you can choose, but whether that's with the D Department of Homeland Security, Department of State, many other smaller departments underneath those, um, Department of Defense, uh, the intelligence community. Um, but this is open to first year students all the way up until uh, senior year students. And then there's also the Boren Fellowship. So as an undergrad, you would apply to the Boren Scholarship. As a graduate student, you would apply to the Boren Fellowship. Uh, and Boren can support up to a full year of academic study abroad, um, as long as the emphasis on that study is foreign language study. You can also be taking other classes. You can be pursuing maybe an internship alongside that program. Um, but in most cases for the Boren application, you are able to pitch to that review committee. This is the language I'm studying. This is the country that I'm studying it in. And it does need to be a country where that language is primarily spoken. Um, and this is what I'm going to be doing during my experience. Um, you will see that there are a few opportunities on Boren's website that is a curated program. And that's for some languages that they um, don't feel as many students apply to as they would like to see, um, like specifically Turkish, um, uh, Bahasa, um, and a few other African languages. Um, and they do have the only French program that is available is a French in West Africa program. I believe that is in Senegal. Um, and those programs are about six months in length, where I believe for all of them, you would be studying at the University of Wisconsin for the summer before you then go to the fall in country. But again, outside of those curated programs, the other 95% of these programs are up to you to choose from. Uh, and you can start by looking at resources through Florida State University, through our Modern Languages Department, through our Global Exchange Program. Many of our applicants will use those. Um, but to be competitive, you need to at least pitch to them a program idea that is going to be at least six months in duration, unless you are a STEM student, uh, only STEM applicants, and that is because uh, very few STEM students have that flexibility in their schedule to be able to accommodate this type of experience abroad. STEM students can apply for a summer, but anyone else it needs to be at least six months to a full academic year. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that for foreign, you don't need to, outside of that French program in Senegal, I believe, you don't need to come to any of these programs with intermediate or advanced proficiency in the language. You just need to come to it with a, with a mature understanding of this is why I need to study the language on my way to a career in this field. Um, and so the, I think the award amount for born is like somewhere around like twenty five dollars or $30,000 that you can apply towards that program. Um, and then on the back end of this experience, so say I apply to this as a sophomore, I receive it, I go during my junior year. Then after I graduate with my bachelor's degree, I have about a like two to five year window. Boren is really flexible on this, and I want to really emphasize that. Um, you do have a one year commitment to work for the federal government. Um, these uh, listed on the PowerPoint are their tier one programs, but they have tier two, tier three programs as well, just in, in terms of what they want to prioritize, where in your application you, are you will articulate both, this is how I plan to spend my one year of federal service. Maybe you can do some research into these websites and find some really excellent entry level programs uh, or positions uh, that would be appropriate with the degree that you have, with the experience that you have. And then in that application, I would ideally like you to also articulate where do you hope to go after that one year of service? Maybe that is um, graduate school. And then from graduate school, maybe you're planning on returning to that department, a different department, um, because what is not effective in these applications 
is uh, an applicant that is going to say, well, I am studying uh, Mandarin Chinese because I want to be a Foreign Service Officer, and I'm just going to be a Foreign Service. That's how I'm going to spend my one-year commitment. I'm going to be a Foreign Service Officer because um, I can tell you, um, while you might be 22 and with all the best experiences in the world, um, I think the average age for an FSO is like, like 33, 34. Um, that doesn't mean you can't start that early, but what it does mean is in the application, Warren likes to see that scaffolding for what are you going to do in order to take the steps that you need to to get to that career that you see for yourself. Um, now, if I think we scroll down to the next slide, I was trying to do it. oh, that's okay. I should have, I should have not sent it as a uh, as a PDF. Um, <clears throat> there we go. All right, so eligibility, U.S. citizenship. Um, there is so you do need to complete your born experience by the time that you graduate. This is for the born scholarship. Um, we do have, uh, it's a bit of a known caveat, and it's, you know, not breaking any rules. Boren is well aware of this as well, um, to where if you are a fourth year student applying to this program and you receive it, um, you are still allowed to uh, go and have this experience up to this year long experience and still, you know, walk with your peers, like for quote unquote graduation in the spring semester. But we work with the registrar's office uh, to basically hold your diploma. So you're almost in like this, like uh, this limbo, you know, where you're still affiliated with Florida State University. You're allowed to get the funding and go on this experience that you need. And once that concludes, then your diploma is posted. And it's like, hey, you officially graduated, but you know, so anyways, we can work with you is what I'm saying. So um, if you're still in your fourth year or you will be next year, uh, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, otherwise, for the foreign fellowship, really the only way that that differs from the scholarship is that you do have the ability to, as a master's or PhD student, um, in addition to your language study, you can also be uh, pursuing research if it's relevant for your dissertation. Um, now, we usually have, this is, an, uh, so the foreign scholarship, and this might be on the next slide, I, I believe is due uh, in late January and early February. It differs from the scholarship and the fellowship, um, but we have a campus deadline that is optional, uh, albeit uh, is strongly encouraged that you meet it. Um, so, for example, the uh, the Truman campus deadline is non-negotiable. If you don't meet that, you don't apply. But for Boren, we give you the additional benefit of uh, if you meet this campus deadline, uh, uh, we will pair you with a faculty member at Florida State University that uh, either studies these languages, works in international affairs, or works in policy studies, who's very familiar with what Boren is looking for to interview you, give you feedback on your application, and then write uh, a complete, a brief endorsement of your application that serves as an additional, uh, say, recommendation letter. Um, and so if you meet our December deadline, uh, we'll pair you with them so you can hopefully interview before the semester wraps up, or at the very least, it would be in early January, and then we can apply those edits towards your application. Okay. Florida Gubernatorial uh, Fellowship. Um, and, uh, I, and I believe Dr. Uh, Byler worked with Sandy Kunin pretty extensively and can kind of speak to her experience as well. But this is a this is a fellowship at FSU because, I mean, partly because, you know, our students are fantastic, but it's also housed in Tallahassee, you know, so it's a little bit more accessible. But this is for um, college students, both undergraduates and graduate students and law students in the state of Florida that are interested in careers in policy, careers uh, in government, careers in politics, it's uh, careers in law, it's like very open-ended, um, but essentially careers in public service. Um, this is open to college sophomores, like I said, all the way up into graduate and professional school students, um, and it's a fully paid year-long internship to work with state government. Um, and they they list all of the departments that are options for which you can intern with. However, there's no guarantee that there will be a position open in that specific office. Uh, but in your application, it's very similar to Truman in the fact that you are writing a policy proposal, but it does need to be specific to the state of Florida. I have had students that have written policy proposals um, as hyper specific as the, the way in which specific law is worded and how in changing that wording, they can uh, broaden the impact 
of this uh, policy to be more helpful and more uh, more inclusive, more supportive to uh, students that focus on statewide policy implementation or, or procedures, uh, wherever you fall in that spectrum of things that are very specific and hyper local to statewide, it doesn't matter as long as you can support your case. Um, and then you can connect that policy to the department that you would like to internship uh, intern with for that upcoming year. We've had students that have worked in the Department of Transportation, the Department of Education, the Department of Children and Family, um, you know, very diverse opportunities. Um, and these are paid internships. I know unpaid internships are still far too common. Uh, this one uh, does compensate you well. Um, and it comes with a tuition waiver uh, if you're uh, if, if you're an enrolled student. You can still do this as an alumnus. I should have clarified. You don't need to be enrolled, um, but you do get the benefit of that tuition waiver. Um, and if you are a junior or senior and doing this, you don't have to do this as a full-time 40-hour-per-week internship. Uh, you can do this part-time and still receive the same benefits. Um, Anything that I missed? Due February, it's due in the early spring. It starts in July. Um, so again, one that falls pretty early after that winter break. So one that we should still be talking to you about in the fall semester, and then we can finalize everything once we get back uh, from winter break. The PPIA, uh, Public Policy and International Affairs Fellowship, um, this is similar to Truman in that it is during your junior year, uh, but it is different from Truman in that this is a a graduate school preparation program. Um, and so you take classes over the summer at these uh, JSIs that are listed under this bullet point, Carnegie Mellon, UC Berkeley, Princeton, U Michigan, U Minnesota. Um, and they will cover the, the, the cost of your coursework. Um, and, and if you perform well during this program on the back end of this, one of the major benefits, one of the major draws for students in applying to PPIA is that if you attend graduate school at any of these partner institutions, there is additional graduate support or uh, tuition support or tuition waivers um, that you can apply towards uh, your education there. Um, and so PPIA, again, it's it's a little bit more specific, you know, in, in terms of your field of study, but they are still very open ended as long as your graduate degree uh, program that you're proposing is somewhere within uh, the policy and the international affairs realm. Um, but pretty straightforward fellowship though. Uh, U.S. citizenship. Uh, so you need to, uh, so essentially what this bullet point means, graduation day between December 20, 25, and December, it, it, you need to be a junior. That, that's when you need to apply to this. Um, but yeah, early November. So it is uh, early in the fall, sem uh, all the, early in the fall semester. Um, the reason why we group uh, these next uh, list of fellowships together is because, well, at least for Wrangell and Pickering, the application is uh, identical uh, and pain is not too far off. Um, but these are all opportunities for you to attend graduate school, earn a master's degree in international affairs or a related field. There are many related fields that you can see on the website. Um, and and it did, I mean, yes, they cover the cost of your tuition, but it's also the internships and the experiences that they provide where this is a really valuable experience. And so for Pickering and Wrangell, I believe it's after your first year, uh, it's a domestic internship that they support. And then after your second uh, year, you would go and work at like a, a U.S. embassy abroad, you know, so you also get the international experience. But the similar to the Boren scholarship, so Boren only requires one year of federal service uh, the, all of these, I believe it's five years that they require. So you really need to demonstrate that you're committed to work in this field to be really competitive. Um, but uh, so uh, Carolina Echeverry is one of those examples where his, historically, at least our background with this experience is we, we saw a lot of success with our applicants who had a little bit of separation from their undergraduate experience. You don't need to go and pursue a Fulbright to be competitive. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but we've had students that have graduated, gone on to pursue other international experiences or internship experiences in their, in their fields uh, to really demonstrate that commitment. Um, but our, our Pickering recipient for this year is a current graduating senior, uh, Jenna Prunty, I believe. Um, so you can still apply, and you should definitely still apply during your senior year if you're considering starting graduate school the following fall for any of these. But know that as an alumnus, you're still more than welcome to work with our office in applying to these. 
Really, the only difference with the uh, Payne Scholarship uh, is that they are specific to careers with USAID. Um, otherwise, Wrangell and Pickering are pretty open-ended. So yes, they're all due relatively around the same time. Wrangell and Pickering are due first, uh, due around the end of September. You have a little bit more time with pain, not due until November. But there is also, very similar to the PPIA program, a really excellent summer opportunity called the Wrangell Summer Enrichment Program that you can apply to as a sophomore. You could also apply to it as a junior, um, where you are taking summer courses at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, Plenty of site visits, plenty of guest speakers. They make it a really immersive experience, uh, and it is to help prepare you for graduate school in these broader fields within international affairs and public policy. Anything that I missed? So how can the Office of National Fellowships uh, help you in, in this process? Um, it, it begins with managing these applications and all of these written components, letters of recommendation or letters of affiliation or all of these pieces that you need in order to submit a compelling application. As you could probably tell from the presentation, all of these have different deadlines throughout your freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year or throughout the fall and spring. And so we're here as a resource to make sure that you meet all of these deadlines on time and that you have, kind of skipping ahead to this essay critiquing, that you have the essays that are going to be competitive at the national level. So when we're in the throes of the application process, whether you're working with myself, Dr. Filer, or Bonnie, who's not here today, um, we are sitting down with you and making sure that your writing is as compelling as possible and that you're truly conveying your ideas, your passions, your interests, and your goals. Um, it can also be difficult for students um, to, to understand who they need to be reaching out to in order to support their application. Some mm -hmm. fellowships, like Truman, for example, I believe you need to have a, a recommendation letter that uh, focuses on leadership, another that focuses on service, and another that focuses uh, on your academic uh, credentials. But then other opportunities, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more open-ended. You know, we always usually uh, defer to faculty, you know, people who can speak to your academic ability, your time here at Florida State. Um, and so general advice that I would give to any student in their first year, second, third year, doesn't matter, is go to office hours, engage in your classes, talk to your professors, you know, find a research opportunity or a DIS opportunity, something that can help you build those relationships with your faculty. So that when you do get to these applications, it happens rarely, but I don't want it to ever happen to you, is that I have students with all the credentials in the world in terms of like their goals or ideas, the courses they've taken, you know, and what they've done on campus. But then when they get to it's like, oh, you need three letters of recommendation. And they're like, well, I could think of one. Uh, but you know what? The reason why you can't apply simply is like, I don't have the people in my corner, you know, so be making and building those relationships now. Um, we also, in terms of resources, uh, throughout the fall and spring semester, we are hosting workshops writing workshops where we put you with your peers. You can sit down, get other eyes on your application. Um, we also will host guest speakers and alumni of these different fellowships, many of the ones that we've talked about today, to share their experience and how that has shaped both their time at Florida State, but also their time after and into their career. So be uh, perusing our website to find those upcoming dates. Um, and then, yeah, you know, between Craig, myself, and Bonnie, we have plenty of alumni, plenty of contacts within these different fellowships and these organizations to where if you have specific questions or concerns, we can put you in contact with the people that are able to help you. So that's our contact information. Um, we're a very small office. Uh, we are, well, I was going to say we're about to expand, but unfortunately, uh, Keyshawn is graduating. We are just supplementing, uh, you know, we're the with a full-time position. So we are still an office of four. You have met 50% of the office. Um, and so we like to think that also translates into our advising style. We like to be very personable. Um, but questions about any of these fellowships that we've talked about today, questions about the office or anything that we can address before we wrap up? We might also just say we'll send this recording out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you register for the presentation, either in person or online, yeah, we'll send you the slides. We'll send you the recording so you'll get this. And you can respond back to that to set up a meeting. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We know most, uh, plenty of you are focused on uh, finals and wrapping up the semester. And so our meeting doesn't have to be an in-depth review of any of your written materials. We can simply sit down, talk about your ideas, your interests. 
Uh, and as I'm doing right now is meeting with students to just talk about, hey, what's that thing you want to apply to in November? You know, and so cool. We'll check back in at the end of the summer. But, no questions in the chat. Cool. Of course, thank you all for joining, either in person or virtual. Um, we look forward to working with you in the future.